Now, obviously, here in the United States, there's a bit of vaccine hesitancy. We've seen this all around the world. Uh, A lot of people are really afraid to take a medication that is just not fully FDA approved. And that's reasonable. Many of us are vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated. Most of the people I know in my life are fully vaccinated. But the only vaccines I have ever taken in my life were FDA approved. Um, This vaccine, however, these vaccines, I should say, the numerous vaccines that are out there circulating in the United States are not FDA approved. They're FDA They're authorized for emergency use. That is different. The FDA gives authorization for emergency use only when they feel like the situation is dire. There's no other treatment. The disease is killing people. It's an absolute emergency. Um, They've never given an authorized emergency authorization for any vaccine ever except for one and one only to the military. And that was for anthrax. So all of the vaccines you or I or anyone we know here in the United States that we've taken, they've all been fully approved by the FDA, which meant they went through rigorous long-term testing before they were allowed to be given to everybody in the population. Emergency authorization is very different. We don't know the long-term side effects. That's a fact. Now, people, I'm seeing this all around social media. I was in an, uh, a discussion with a woman even today on my Facebook page where she says, you know, here are some facts about the vaccines. The FDA wouldn't allow us to take it if it weren't safe. So those of you who are claiming that, oh, no, this is uh, potentially unsafe or it hasn't been rigorously tested, you are, are, are spouting off a false narrative. And, and the facts are this is perfectly safe because the FDA has authorized it. Or in her case, she said the FDA has approved it. And I pointed out to her that's actually not the case. The FDA has not approved this. This has been authorized. And she says, yeah, but uh, there have been numerous vaccines in the past that have been uh, swiftly brought out to the public and it was fine. She mentioned smallpox and polio. However, the smallpox vaccine took literally hundreds of years Uh, (laughs) actually hundreds of years. Smallpox had been around since uh, 1500s as some of the earliest documentation of smallpox. They didn't actually have an effective vaccine for smallpox until I believe the 1800s or even early 1800s is when they finally had um, an effective vaccine for smallpox. Polio took decades. They tried to get a vaccine for polio. Again, a disease that they had known about for a long, long time. Smallpox and polio had been around for a very, very long time. These were not new. They were not novel. They were not, oh no, we've never seen these before. They had known about these diseases. They had tested these diseases. They had worked with these diseases for a very, very long time before they were finally able to come out with a vaccine. The polio vaccine took at least three decades. They were attempting to make a polio vaccine in the 1930s, and they didn't finally get one actually out to the public until the 1960s. Uh, So we don't really have a past example of a swiftly rolled out vaccine that was actually really successful. Um, Ebola was made very quickly. That vaccine was made very, very quickly. Yet there are, I believe, 20 something people sitting in quarantine here in the United States after returning from Africa for fear that they might have Ebola. Well, if the vaccine worked, the one that was, uh, by the way, made by Johnson and Johnson, then why would we have people in quarantine potentially for Ebola exposure? So, um, you know, we don't know. They and they don't know. They're unclear. They're they're it's uncertain how well things are working. And of course, they should be safer by putting people in quarantine just in case. That's reasonable, even if they think yes, it works. But we don't have enough data, we don't have enough information, we don't have enough history with this to really fully know. It is totally reasonable. And that's the right attitude. The right attitude is to say, you know, this might work really, really well. And it very well might be the saving grace that we all need, but we actually don't really fully know. And this is something that has gone on numerous times throughout history. There have been many instances of vaccines or drugs, especially drugs in particular, which have been approved by the FDA, used for a variety of elements, ailments, and then later withdrawn. Let me just show you a list right here. This is a list of withdrawn drugs. This is just from Wikipedia. You can look up this on your own. This right here is the list of withdrawn drugs. Now, look at how long this list is. It keeps going and 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 going. And and there it goes. 
Uh, all of those drugs had been found to have side effects that were unknown at the time of approval or unknown at the time of administration. Some of these things, uh, many of these drugs were not actually administered in the United States or they were never given FDA approval in the United States. Uh, many of them were. Many of these are from other countries where other country scientists said, yeah, this is good to go. And then it wasn't. So even if we just look at this long list of drugs, you know, we can see right here, let's let's go ahead and do a search based on uh, let's sort this based on the date that it was withdrawn and these are the countries so what it's got here when you're looking at this chart you've got the drug name of the actual drug the withdrawn date the country that it was withdrawn from and the reason why it was withdrawn the remarks is why okay so even if we just look at the last you know 20 or 30 years many of these these start in the 60s and this continues to go on and we look at just some of the recent withdrawn medications. You know, let's go to the U.S. here, 2000. Um, I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing some of these because you know how drugs are. But this one is allos, um, allosteron, which is sold under the brand name Lotrinex. Is used for the management of severe diarrhea, predominant irritable bowel syndrome in women only. OK, so women were using this and then they withdrew that drug in 2000 when they realized it cre it caused serious gastrointestinal adverse events, uh, severe constipation. So it basically did the uh, you know, it was it was making things much worse. And they were like, oh, OK, how about this one right here? Sci uh, Cisapride. Uh, OK, this one is a drug that increases mortality, uh, mot motility in the upper ga uh, gastrointestinal tract. You could tell I did not go to medical school, <laughs> cannot pronounce any of these. No wonder doctors don't talk much, right? Because all the words are too big. They're just like, it's better to just, you know, look smart. Uh, don't say anything. <laughs> Can't pronounce any of these. Um, it acts as a direct it, it acts directly as a serotonin receptor and uh, ag agonist and indirectly as a parasympathetic. I give up, guys. Anyway, they withdrew this. They said, oh, it causes fatal cardiac arrhythmias. OK, how about this one right here? Uh, Dexatrim. They said, oh, yeah, that causes hemorrhage uh, stroke. It causes a stroke. OK, uh, this one, Resolin, that causes hepatotoxicity which is liver damage. Oh, great. You take this drug, you're going to get some liver damage. No big deal, guys, right? Go ahead, take it. The FDA said it was fine. They approved it. Your doctor prescribed it. You should take it. That is, you know, this is what's going on here. So you've got a variety of these drugs here. Um, you've got, <clears throat> what is this one here? Just kind of looking at these. Gatoflaxacin is an antibiotic of the fourth generation family, blah, blah, blah. Inhibits bacterial enzyme. DNA, I don't, I don't even know what is this for. Increased risk of dysglycemia. Dysglycemia. Uh, liver damage. Another one causes liver damage here. Risk for heart valve damage. Risk for heart attack, stroke, unstable angia. Um, increased risk of death. This one, what was that? Apo, uh, aprotinin. It's a, it's, what is it used for? This thing is used for medication admin. Oh, I'd have to click on the link. I don't want to click on that. Oh, look at this one. This one will give you risk of severe depression and suicide. Um, increased risk of heart attacks and stroke. This drug here, uh, propo, pro, propoxyphene. I think I maybe got that one. So, you know, look, this is kind of what we're what we're seeing here, right, is we're seeing that there is this obvious increase risk um, of uh, well, with these these drugs, what they found was this increased risk of all of these potential problems. And so they then had to withdraw the drugs when they realized that it was, uh, you know, that these could not be actually widely prescribed very easily. There have been, uh, let me see here, I do have another, um, there's actually now some reasons why we shouldn't be taking, I want to uh, show you sometimes some vaccine stuff here, because those were drugs, so let's go ahead and look at some of the vaccine stuff. 
So measles, so here's some examples of unexpected adverse effects from some past vaccines that we can kind of learn from. Measles, the widespread, highly effective vaccination against the childhood diseases, disease started with some severe consequences. Thousands of children, thousands of children who received a particular inactivated vaccine in the early 1960s were then exposed to the actual measles virus developed uh, developed atypical measles characterized by high fever, se severe abdominal pain, inflammation of the lung issue, issue. They required hospitalization. So they had some issues with the measles vaccine. Now, I don't think any of the vaccines for COVID actually contain live virus, although the Chinese one contains um, what's supposed to be like dead virus of COVID. So that one would have potentially a chance of live virus when they're using that sort of thing. Here in the United States, we don't have any vaccines available to us that are using that sort of, you know, any sort of um, virus, actual virus particles from the uh, from COVID. Here was one, though from a vaccine recently, remember Da Nang fever. So the Philippines halted a school-based vaccination program in 2017. So this was pretty recent after reports of complications and, and several deaths linked to the product Dangvaxia. Now this was made by the French, a French manufacturer, Sanofi Pasteur, later said that the vaccine posed a risk to people without prior infection from one of the disease's four stereotypes, actually increasing the risk that the child would contract a more severe form of the disease. Now, this one is important because this is one that I think a lot of people are actually afraid of. Now, most people, when they get the shot, they go on Facebook or Twitter and they say, oh, I got the jab. It was no big deal. I was a little sore. I got a bit of a fever. Maybe I got some chills, but otherwise I'm fine. And so they're saying, don't be a big baby. Go ahead and get the vaccine. And others are saying, that's not what I'm afraid of. I'm not afraid of the needle. I'm not afraid of obviously a sore arm after you stick a needle in me. I'm not afraid of the fact that I might have some side effects like a fever or a stomach ache. Uh, I'm worried about something else that might come about later on that we don't know about. And that's exactly what happened in this particular vaccine, Denvaxia. They found that if you were a child that had never been exposed whatsoever to any form of Denang fever, there are apparently four different um, stereotypes. So maybe these are strains of the of the fever. And if you had never been exposed to any of those and you ended up getting this vaccine and then you later were uh, you later did end up with one of the vax, one of the uh, one of the virus, one of the strains, then you actually ended up with a more severe form of the disease, a severe form. So it made it worse when you got it. And so the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, approved the vaccine last year, but for limited use. So they have extremely specific cases when you could take this uh, Denvaxia. What they do is they only now give it to children of certain ages living in endemic areas and they needed to be previously infected with a form of the virus. And that is the only way you could get this vaccine. So, um, you know, look, we don't know what kind of effect these vaccines that we're taking right now might have on, uh, you know, mutated strains of the virus later on. What if a mutated strain comes around a year or two from now and suddenly everybody who got vaccinated today is getting a worse form of that virus in a couple of years? We don't know. Now, look. The chances of that are low, right? I mean, we haven't had anything that severe or that, um, you know, that stark sort of happen with any of these vaccines. So I don't think, you know, I, I don't I don't think the risk I don't think that we're, you know, I don't know. Then again, we don't know because mRNAs are totally different. We haven't really rolled those out with any vaccine ever. They've attempted to do study is uh, testing with mRNAs in the past for other viruses and it didn't end up so well, which is why they ended up not using it. So we don't really actually know when it comes to an mRNA. But uh, look, that this is what people are, are saying. People are just saying, I'm not quite comfortable taking this vaccine. It's not fully FDA approved. It's only authorized. We don't really know what the long term effects are. We don't know how this will affect things like, you know, there's some women that are afraid of infertility from this because they've heard some rumors here or there or something. And it's like, look, and then they say, no, no, you know, there's no what they say. And you have to pay attention to the words. They say there's no proof of ri of, of losing, you know, of of risk of infertility. There's no proof of this. And then you say, well, there's no proof it doesn't either. You don't have proof of anything at this point because nobody knows. Nobody knows. 
And then all of a sudden, you know, you guys approve. In the past, there have been drugs you guys have actually approved. So you could say, well, then wait for it to be approved. And then once it's approved, you have no excuse, except I just showed you a long list of drugs that have once been approved that are no longer approved. So that have been withdrawn where they say, oops, we're not going to allow that drug to be used for that reason anymore. Many drugs are just sitting on the shelf, not being used whatsoever for anything. Maybe in the future, they'll find something to use it for. So they kind of keep an eye on it, thinking, well, maybe it didn't work for what we thought it would work for, but maybe it'll work for something else. They repurpose that drug. But otherwise, you know, look, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is out to make a lot of money. And that is what they've always cared for. They don't care necessarily about the actual health of the of people, right? They're caring more about their bottom line, and and of course they want to have an effective product because they. So there is there is a motivation to have a highly effective product. The more effective it is, the more people want it. So that's fair. They want something that works, um, but. Right now, you know, what we're seeing a lot is a lot of this conversation going on on social media where people are shaming people for not wanting to take the vaccine, treating them like they're they're uh, partisan political hacks or treating them like they're anti-vaxxers in some way or they don't believe in science or they don't believe in facts. And the fact is, we just don't know enough. And then you look at, for example, what has gone on in. Uh, Europe when it comes to AstraZeneca, right? Um, the British health authorities yesterday actually recommended an alternative to AstraZeneca's vaccine for adults under 30 when possible because they found that there actually was some evidence that AstraZeneca was linked to rare blood clots. So now even the British, the ones who made it, they're saying, well, OK, uh, it does look like for young people who otherwise would not be at risk of COVID are actually at increased risk of this vaccine. So it says here that their decision came after a review of the European Economic Area and UK data found. I'm not reading that. Sorry. Um, uh, from the European Economic Area and UK data from 86 cases of blood clots resulting in 18 deaths out of 25 million people receiving the vaccine. So um, they say that most of the cases reported have occurred in women under 60 years of age within two weeks of vaccination. So Again, low risk. Most of the high risk we've seen have been men. Uh, men over the age of 65 are at higher risk of severe COVID than even women are. So, you know, look, they currently, even with the vaccines that are out there, they are saying, well, you know, now we're kind of learning some things as we're administering this to millions upon millions of people. We're learning as we go. So that right there, the fact that they are admitting even that they're learning as they go, that they're now sort of saying, well, OK, now we're not going to give it to these people and we're going to continue giving it to these people. That's alarming in and of itself. But I really just wanted to sort of point out the fact uh, during this segment here that there is a long history of doctors telling us something is safe something is good for us, something will heal us, and it's instead done the exact opposite, or it's in many cases made things worse. We have a history, a documented history of withdrawn medications that were once fully approved, that were once touted as safe and effective. We've got an opioid crisis on our hands in this country because doctors continue to prescribe medication to patients full well knowing that those patients were becoming addicted to that drug and it would ruin their lives. So. I don't know if we can always point blank trust the scientific or medical community and especially big pharma. I don't know if they're really the ones that we should say, you know, you're honorable. You're like a Boy Scout. I can absolutely trust you. Uh, I think the evidence has shown that we should always question what our doctors are prescribing for us. We should always question the treatments. And that is something that's actually ingrained in our culture. We always say, seek a second opinion. That's normal. And suddenly now it's not. Right. Suddenly now people are saying, well, if you question at all, then you are a science denier. If you question at all, then you are an anti-vaxxer. You are just a right wing QAnon conspiracy theorist. That's what you are. So um, wanted to just point this out, wanted to point out the, the many drugs that have been withdrawn, the times that vaccines even themselves have been. Um, they they modified the usage protocol, who could take it, who could not take it. And the times that, um, you know, that uh, basically that we just that we maybe just need to step back and say, I just want to take a beat. I want to I want to 
decide for myself. I think it's perfectly, I think it's perfectly fine if somebody decides they want to take it. I don't have anything against that at all. Plenty of people in my life have taken it. And I'm not, and I'm, I think it's perfectly fine if you don't want to take a certain medicine that isn't fully FDA approved, or even if it is, I think it's perfectly fine. And I think we need to, as a society, understand that a free society is one that allows people the freedom to say, I'm sorry, that's just not for me. Or yes, sign me up. That is a free society. And we need to do everything we can to protect our free society. So uh, please be sure to email me your thoughts. Let me know what do you think. If you have other examples of medical treatments, drugs, um, other things that have been recommended that are now no longer recommended, that are now considered uh, to totally antiquated and even draconian. I mean, c could you imagine if the doctors and the researchers and the scientists were always right, we would still be using the medications and the treatments of the 1800s. Why improve? If the doctors are so spot on right the, the first time, if the science is always so sound, if it's just fact, why do we even improve? Why try? We're perfect, right? That's it's perfect the first time it comes out. But please email me your thoughts. Uh, give me your ideas, your suggestions. Love to hear from you. You can email me Kim at Kim Iverson .com.